Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. Hope everyone is having a good day. Uh, as always, give me a thumbs up if you can hear and see me, or at least hear me, uh, so we can get this party started. Is it a party? I don't know. I might, might, might be trying a bit too hard. Oh, thanks, Dave. We got a thumbs up. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask a, a question of you guys, uh, and then I'm going to do my little monologue whatever it's called. And then we'll go back to the question. But the question is in retirement, do you, do you do, do you, do you do? I was an English major. That doesn't sound right. In retirement, do you do volunteer work? That's the question. Just yes or no. If, if you're not retired yet, but you plan to do volunteer work, you can answer it too, you know? So anyway, I'm not going to try to wordsmith that terrible question. Oh, look at all the thumbs up I got. Wow. David, Paul, Kyle, Daniel, Keith, Mark, Wolfster, Vinyl is in the house. I even pulled I pulled Vinyl over from another YouTube tab, so that who knows what he was watching. Okay, so uh, the the sort of question of the of the week or, or of the show that I wanted to touch on uh, is this question. You can ask it a couple of different ways. The way I phrased it was how do you, how to invest when stocks are, are expensive. Uh, maybe another way to think about that is. Should we consider valuations uh, in our investment decisions? And and so, the, the interesting thing for to me about that question is, you know, I do invest in a few individual stocks, not not a whole lot, uh, but in the case of an individual stock, that's my primary consideration: is the company at least fairly valued? I do my best to answer that question. Uh, you know, if you follow Warren Buffett and his work, I mean, he's a value investor, or at least, again, not overpaying for an investment. And you might have a great company, but if you pay far above its intrinsic value, you're not really getting a great deal there. But when it comes to mutual funds, you know, in ETFs, sort of the buy and hold index fund, three fund portfolio, whatever you've got, I don't give a second thought to valuation. You know, if we make a IRA or 401k contribution or whatever, I just put it in and put it, add it to whatever fund, you know, I need to, in terms of maintaining my asset allocation. I don't think about it uh, in terms of the valuation of say the S&P 500. So, so how could we think about it? And uh, the reason I decided to make it the topic today, let's, well, first, because stocks are still pretty richly valued. We can use the, the, the um, Schiller PE. It's a, it's a sort of a normalized, a cyclic, cyclically adjusted PE. So you got the price and the earnings, right? It's a ratio between a price over earnings. The price we know of a of an index or a, a, an ETF or a stock, but what, in terms of earnings, what do we use? So some will use sort of an estimate of the of the earnings expected over the next twelve months. Some use tra the trailing twelve months earnings. Well, what what the, the Schiller PE does, and here it is. It goes back over ten years. Uh, adjusts the earnings for inflation and uses that. And the theory behind it is you, you get earnings over a whole economic cycle, you know, a recession, you have growth and so forth. And so, and as you can see right now, we're at 34. We're not at the all time high, but boy, I mean, we had the peak here, the tech bubble. And then we had this peak here, I guess, after COVID or towards the end of, I don't know, when did COVID end? Is it, is it, has it ended? Maybe it hasn't ended. I don't know. Uh, but we're still really high. We come down here, the, the mean and the median, uh, you know, 16 to 17. So, you know, we're, we're pretty richly valued right now, right? It's one way to look at it. And so how could we use that? Well, uh, and I've gotten a number of emails from folks on this question. One would be if you've got the sort of lump sum versus dollar cost averaging question, because you've got a bonus or an inheritance or whatever, uh, or you're rolling over a 401k, which is kind of interesting to me. I get these emails a lot. People are rolling over a 401k and they had it invested in whatever. Um, and they um, it, it was taken to cash, moved to an IRA, and now they're kind of scared to reinvest it. And I'm always like, well, yesterday you had it invested. Why not just do what you did yesterday, but inside an IRA? But in any event, Dollar cost averaging versus lump sum. And the theory is, or the question is, Rob, I know your views on that. And lump sum normally wins, but not always. But what about when stocks are richly valued? It's a good question. 
Uh, that's that's one way it comes into play. Another question I get is, should I change my stock bond allocation? Maybe you're 90-10, but you're a little nervous about stocks. Should I make it 80-20 or 70-30? And then the third way, and this is the way that that um, might resonate with me, uh, and that is not to change your stock bond allocation per se, but within the stock allocation, maybe change up your asset classes. So today, for example, you might say, I'm going to do, I'm going to move even more to international, maybe even to emerging markets, because on a valuation basis, they're cheaper than US stocks. Uh, and we can look at that. I can just show you what I mean. Let's see here. We'll go to uh, Morningstar. So if we go to, um, we'll just use VU, that's S&P's, uh, Vanguard's S&P 500. And I need to be a little careful here uh, because Morningstar often uses a normalized version of PE, which I'm not always a fond, fond of. Not the Schiller one I just showed you, but, um, whoops, wrong tab, portfolio tab. The PE is 20. So I think that's roughly right. The The thing is, we can actually go, let's go to Yahoo Finance. I don't normally, can't spell Yahoo. I don't normally use this one on the show, but I don't, I don't know why not. It's perfectly fine. If we go to VTI here, uh, are they showing the same PE? Oh, they're actually a little higher. But still, either way, 20 on Morningstar. Uh, Yahoo uses trailing 12 months, which is what is my preference. They're 23.89, but let's go to, um, let's see if they give me uh, the PE of a mutual fund. I could use the ETF version. They don't. Hang on for a second. ETF version of VMAX. I don't know the ticker. I guess I could have just looked it up. Oh, that's right. VWO. I should have remembered that. Uh, so VWO is a Vanguard Emerging Market Fund. I've owned it in the past. I don't own it now. Uh, look at the PE, 11. I don't, know how, I don't know how well you can see it, but on a trailing 12-month basis, S&P 500 is 23. And uh, just as an example, Emerging Markets is 11. And so one theory would be, okay, we're going to keep our stock bond allocation, whatever it is, but we'll move more into international, maybe more specifically into emerging markets, which is sort of a, a subclass of international, right? Or maybe small cap value because it's also uh, uh, cheap, cheaper, less expensive, uh, If you at least based on a sort of PE analysis. You could use other valuation metrics, but I think they'd all show that something like an S&P 500 is more expensive. Uh, and so why not do that? And, and by and large, I don't do that. And there's there's a couple of reasons for it. One is a, a timing question, because just because something's expensive doesn't mean it's going to go down in price anytime soon. And just because something's cheap, you know, relatively speaking, doesn't mean it's going to go up anytime soon. And so you can find yourself having made some significant change to your portfolio only to watch it underperform. And so there's this sort of psychological component to that. And I'll show you what I mean. If we go back to the Schiller PE, I mean, it's been above the average. I mean, it dipped here. It, this is, well, this is the, the financial crisis, right? But ever since then, I mean, that was 15 years ago. Uh, ever since then, it's been well above, you know, the median and the mean. And so, you know, maybe we could have made a change all the way back whenever, 13, 14, 15. And, um, and and missed out on pretty significant growth. But the, there's another problem in my mind, and I'll be curious what you guys think in here in the, in the chat. But as you start to make these changes, even if they work out, however we define that, uh, you then have, you're then left with the question, well, when do I go back to what I had? Now, I suppose one could say, well, Rob, we'll just use valuations again. And if you move 10 or 20 percent into emerging markets, just as an example, when they become expensive and S&P 500 is cheap or whatever, you'll just move it around again. And I just don't have confidence that most people, myself included, can really do that in a way that's going to be productive, tax efficient, if we're in a taxable account, um, and that's going to, all, at the end of the day, give me better returns than just sticking to what I've got. The other thing I'd point out, in the newsletter last week, um, I had an article, I'll show, show it to you. I included an article 
I think it was last week's newsletter. It's funny, after I send the newsletter out, it's like I almost forget what's in there. Uh, I But I also added it to my site. So, but there was an interesting fact. And the reason I added it to my site is this one. What if you invested at the peak right before the 2008 crisis? Uh, ben Carlson wrote it. Uh, here's his actual site. And he pointed out, if, if you invested at the peak of the market right before the the 2007 to nine you know crash, your total return through now is 345 percent, which comes out to about I, you probably can't read it, but nine and a half percent a year. Now this is obviously just one example, but but the point he was making, I think, is that we shouldn't get we we can't predict we don't we're, there's no way we can predict even if the market's high that's going to go down tomorrow or this month or this year. And even if we get in extraordinarily unlucky, long term, we'll be OK. And so at the end of the day, people have emailed me a lot. Now I'll just send them to the first part of this live Q&A. It's just not something that I personally think I can do successfully. I think it adds a lot of mental and sort of psychological overhead to, the, to what's already a difficult thing to do, and that is, you know, invest and buy and hold. So for me, it's just not something that I, you know, I can't say under no circumstance would I ever do it, but it's certainly not going to be uh, a main part of my approach to investing. Um, all right. Enough of that. Let's get to the good stuff. First of all, let's check out the poll. So 56% of you say you, you in retirement, you volunteer or you plan to. I'm curious if you've put in the, I'd love to hear in the chat now what you're doing it, to the extent you care to share how you're volunteer, you know, maybe where or you don't, you don't have to get specific if you don't want to, just sort of generally. Um, I got an email from a viewer that kind of wanted to know she's trying to figure out what she's going to do, and maybe you can help her out, give her some good ideas. Uh, I don't do any volunteer work. Um, I don't know that it's not that I, I won't. We we I tend to, we tend to contribute, or we, we do contribute to a number to a, a number of charities, um, and and to me that's very important, um, particularly charities that help children is sort of our focus. Um, but at the moment, neither my we we have in the past, particularly my wife. I guess I'm I'm not a volunteer kind of person, but I, I I don't rule it out. Life just seems so busy right now. It's like I don't I don't know that I'd have time. I don't know where I'd find the time. Okay. Well, while you're answering that, ah, uh, here's Mike. Meals on Wheels. That's a good one. That's a very good one. Here's one. Boggy, gotta love that name. Driving people to medical appointments. That is so important. You know, because a lot of people just don't have folks that can help them. Well, here's a good one. Uh, Noreen, when she retires, she wants to raise another guide dog. Thank you for being here, by the way, Noreen. She runs the show here. What else are people doing? One thing to me, it seems, too, about volunteering is there, there could be a really, in retirement, a really important social aspect to it. This is interesting. This person's working on AI safety in retirement. I wonder what that looks like. What else are people doing? I'll get, I'll get to the other questions here. I just want to see. Um, this is actually a question. CH, do you subscribe to having an allocation to small value such as VBR? For a long, long time, I had small cap value. I have a little bit right now. That, well, I always have small cap value, right? Because I'm always in sort of a total U.S. stock fund. So the question really is, do I over allocate to small cap value? Today, not so much. But for a long time, I did. I don't think it's a bad option, but sometimes it doesn't work. It hasn't worked recently, last 10 or 15 years. Uh, but you go back further, it worked wonderfully. Whether it'll work in the future, don't know. All right. Let's see here. I want to go back to the top. So I can't put this, the first few on the screen, as you already know. But 
This one's from Paul. He says, in your 525 newsletter, you link to a Morningstar article about two new actively managed bond funds um, and a mutual fund counterpart. Would there be any reason or advantages to swapping out BND to one of these ETFs uh, for someone in early retirement? There's really, the short answer is I, I, I have no idea, but I find it hard to believe there would be a significant advantage. Now, I will tell you, I've not studied those funds in detail. Um, they're new, so there's not a lot of history. Uh, it, it, you know, I mean, we know from the research that SP Global does, and I did a video on this just the other day, that uh, even in the fixed income space, uh, it's hard for actively managed funds to outperform an, in, you know, an index fund. In some subclasses of fixed income, they have better luck than others. Uh, but it's still not greater than 50% outperforming. And many of them, it's 80 or 90% underperform. You know, whether these specifically will do better, and then you have to think, well, how much better will they actually do and how much will it really matter? Particularly depending on how much you have allocated to these funds. If you're in er if early retirement, I'm going to assume that you still have a heavy weight to stocks. But yeah, that's my best guess. Um, and then Susan won another bond question. For bond fund allocation for a portion of fixed income, is there any advantage to a 50-50 BND VGIT or BNDX? So let's talk about those. So we'll look up, we know BND, that's just a total basically US bond fund. It doesn't include TIPS, but government bonds, uh, some corporate and some agency sort of like mortgage-backed securities. VGIT is the treasury, I'm pretty sure is the treasury fund bgit yeah intermediate term treasury i really like this fund i don't own it i own bnd there but there have been days when i thought i should just switch to this fund i like this fund a lot but at the end of the day is it going to make some dramatic difference to to me and my family and our retirement that choice between bnd on the one hand and vgit on the other probably not um and then bndx is the inter international I, I tend to not invest in international bonds, but I don't think it's it's a bad approach to put some of it in a, in a fund like BNDX. I can tell you that Vanguard's uh, target date funds and their life strategy funds use this. They have some allocation to uh, international bonds, so I certainly don't think it's some mistake at all. I just, I, I haven't, I've, I've never convinced myself that it's necessary. Um, so, and maybe I'm just not thinking hard enough. Maybe it is necessary and I don't know what I'm talking about, which should probably be our going in assumption here. All right. All right I got another question for you guys and then I'll, uh, another poll. And you have to be honest here. The question is, have you bought Bitcoin for the first time? So you never owned it before, but you bought Bitcoin for the first time this year. Just curious. Since it's gone sky high, what's Bitcoin? What's the price now? Like $250 trillion per coin? Bitcoin, I can't type. Bitcoin price, 72000 So I told you, you know, like in October, I think it was, I thought to myself, I should invest in Bitcoin uh, on the theory that it's going to go up in price because the whole having thing, which I don't, ha I don't even understand really. Uh, and the whole, it, it, it'll, it'll be approved by the SEC for ETFs. And, uh, you know, people are just going to flock to it and I'll hold it for three or four months and then just sell. I didn't do that. I should have. Actually, probably not. The problem with doing that and, and being successful, you say, well, what's wrong with that, Rob? I mean, even if you don't believe in Bitcoin as an investment, but you hold it for three or four months, you two or three or four extra money. It's because I would walk away with that thing and, hey, I can do this when I can't. I just got lucky, but I didn't even buy it. I probably would have actually bought it in the form of MicroStrategies stock, a company that I have absolutely no interest in owning whatsoever. But it's just, it would be the easy way to own it in a Roth IRA, right? Because they've basically turned their software company into a Bitcoin ETF. Ridiculous. All right. 
enough of that. Boy, this is this seems like an SAT question from Raj. I don't know. Out of four criteria, turnover, interest, interest pay, hmm, capital gains, and dividend, which one would save money in taxes by investing in IRA ETF? Well, I have, okay. First of all, I have to make sure that IRA is not a ticker for an ETF, and you mean the, a retirement account, right? Uh, well, turnover. Well, let's let's just okay. I'm assuming you're, you're, the question is uh, investing in some kind of ETF in an IRA retirement account. At least that's how I'm interpreting this. Turnover deals with how much they're buying and selling each year, right? Now, that can trigger capital gains. Not necessarily. It depends on, on other factors. They may have some losses that can offset the, the, the gains with. But of course, in an IRA, that doesn't matter to you. Neither does capital gains or dividends, at least from a tax perspective, right? Because it's inside a retirement account, so there's no no taxes for that. But it could matter. The higher the turnover, they have to pay for those. You know, they're paying um, transaction fees, and those get passed down to you and me, and they're not part of the expense ratio. So if there was significant um, turnover, uh, you know, it could generate fees. And I'd also be a little concerned about the strategy. Um, in an index fund, you really don't. At least all the ones I've looked at. Turnover is very small. I'm not sure what you mean by interest paid. Maybe that just means dividends for stocks and interest for, for bonds. And again, inside an IRA, none of that really matters if I'm understanding your question. Vinyl wants to know if, if volunteering includes unpaid political office. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know why not. Sure. I mean, not that I'm the person who defines what volunteer work means. Okay, what's next? Oh, I wanted to show you something real quick. So I showed you this article on my site. It looks like this, by the way, because I went here and just did, uh, just grabbed it, a PDF of it, and there's like an ad in the middle of it. But I have a summary that I wrote up, a one sentence summary, um, some key quotes and some the, the charts, you know, there's a few charts. But I thought I thought just, I don't know, you might be interested in this. How do I do that? How do I get all that information into a, a WordPress site? I start with this application, which is Zotero, Z-O-T-E-R-O. -E it's free. Uh, academics use this. Like if you were gonna write your, 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 your P, you're getting your PhD and you had to track all your research, you'd keep it in, you could, you could keep it in Zotero. Again, it's open source, free software. And um, so I can bring a PDF in and open it up here. Here's what the PDF looks like in Zotero. I can highlight it. I can even, as you can see, that yellow box around the chart. And it brings it over into all these notes. And then um, it creates, I can create an annotation out of it, which is all of this, right? And then... Uh, very, you know, there's a plugin, but I can automatically bring it into, uh, let's see here, Zotero. I'm not Zotero, Obsidian, which is a note taking app. And I can add some information here. I can link to other parts of, of the Obsidian vault that I have. It brings in all the images. Um, and then it's, it's a bit of, at that point, it's a bit of um, cut and paste into WordPress. But um, the um, the colors are important. The green are what end up here as key quotes. You know, it's just a quick take on what I think of it. Usually, the significant findings of of the paper. I've got you know hundreds. I mean, I'm not even. I haven't even scratched the surface. I got so much. I got so much work ahead of me. It's not even funny. All right. So uh, Isabel says, I have cash in a Roth IRA and a few stock and S&P 500 fund. Which funds do you think are good funds for a Roth? Um, so any fund would be fine in a Roth. So for example, if that's the only kind of account you have and you wanted some kind of allocation, I, you could put stock funds, bond funds in a Roth. Yeah. If 
but if you have multiple types of accounts, like you have a taxable account, a Roth, maybe traditional, what I like to put in Roth accounts are the, the funds that have, have, have an expectation of growing the most, which would be stocks, stock funds. Uh, because since a Roth is tax free, uh, assuming we follow all the rules, I want that to get as, I, I like to say, as fat as a tick, which is, uh, I learned that saying from my mom. I learned most of the funny things from my mom. She has, yeah, I don't know if it, her upbringing, what, what happened, but she has a lot. She just uncorks them out of nowhere. Like, you know, where in the world did you get that from? Anyway, that's my answer, Isabel. Hope that helps. All right. Here's another good one. Mike's coaches Special Olympics. That's terrific. All right. Let's, oh, how, let's see how the poll's going. Curious. So most of you did not, at least you might own Bitcoin, but it, it wasn't your first time. 3% said yes. You've probably, so here's the question for the 3%. You've probably made money. How do you know when to sell? That I don't know. I, I don't have an answer to that myself. That's one of the reasons I don't invest in it or gold. I wouldn't know when to sell. Maybe you say you never sell, but they don't do anything. I don't know. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to understand the future. About I don't know. Just don't make no sense to me. So Wolfster wants to know if you roll a Roth 401k into a Roth IRA, does it trigger the new, the five-year rule? So I always try to preface these sorts of questions with, you should assume I'm wrong because I don't know what I'm talking about. So there are two five-year five rules for a Roth IRA, right? One is you, you, you have to have uh, an account open uh, five years. You got to, that's the first five-year rule. And, and it, and it applies to the first Roth IRA you open. And once you meet that rule, you meet it for all, you can open up 30 other Roth IRAs. You meet that rule for all of them. You meet it once and you're, it's one and done. And so that rule I'm pretty sure would apply if it's your first Roth IRA. And your age doesn't matter, right? It's not like, well, once you get to 59 and a half, you don't have to worry about it. If you open up your first Roth IRA at 72, you got to satisfy that five-year rule um, now, if you don't satisfy it, what happens depends on a lot of other things. Because remember, you know, so, but the, I think you're probably talking about the five year rule on Roth IRA conversions. And this is not a conversion. A conversion would be traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, among other things, right? So my hunch is it, it doesn't apply. But um, if I'm wrong, trust me, the chat will, will let me know. I could look it up, but I'll let you do that. You can Google it or just ask your Roth IRA uh, provider or the administrator of your 401k just to make sure you get it right. You don't want to get it wrong. Let's see here. What's next? By the way, if you want to ask me a question or have me cover a topic, put at Rob Berger in it. We've already got our first chess question. What is your favorite opening? Well, that would depend on whether I'm playing the white pieces or the black pieces. For white, I really prefer E4 openings. As to what my opponent plays, I don't know that I have a strong uh, opinion. I mean, yeah, but I play E4. And then, of course, what I play after that depends on what my opponent does. As black, um, I tend to play E5 against E4. And I play uh, this, what's called the semi-slav against d4, which in, in, and if you're not a chess player, this none of this is making any sense, you know. But um, but again, it, it just depends on what they play. I, I like tactical chess, so any you know, I, I love it when 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 I'm black and white tries a gambit, like the king's gambit, for example, uh, because it's usually pieces are usually everywhere and it's a mess.
Okay, Joseph says, keep in mind, I'm still a novice. Convince my daughter, who's 25, to open a Roth. Uh, she's, I guess she's a teacher. Better to go with VU, knowing it will be longer to buy stocks, or cheaper like VDIGX. I don't know what V, let's figure out what VDIGX is. And this is always good. So like, if you're new to all this, we can go to Morningstar, and, and we can go through this. We'll look at uh, V, so just type in the ticker. Oh, the Vanguard Dividend Growth. Um, and so uh, what would, how would you think about these two funds? They're both good funds, but how would you think about them? So they're going to be very similar. Um, my, we can look at uh, VU. My guess is, see this blue dot? What's that telling us? we got this grid, right? So in this top row, you can see it says large here. If the blue dot is somewhere in this top row, it means that on average, the companies in this fund are um, big companies as measured by the value, you know, the outstanding shares of the company times their price. So think um, Apple and, and Microsoft and the like. Uh, of course, it could be anywhere in this row. The higher up it is, the larger. In fact, sometimes you'll see the blue dot outside of this, this grid, you know, up in here. And then... Uh, as it moves left and right, uh, to the right, it's growth. To the left, it's value. And in the middle, that BLD just stands for blend. And all growth means is a, a company um, is growing its revenue and earnings faster than average. is measured by you know price to earnings, price to book. Um, and value means uh, it's not growing as fast, but it's it's they tend to be less expensive. If you think about uh, the cost of a stock, the cost of any investment, at least an investment that actually earns something. Now, uh, um, you can think about it this way. For every dollar, what's it going to cost me to invest in something uh, uh, and, and measure it based on the earnings that the, the, that the company or the thing, it could be a real estate investment. You're going to buy a home or a condo and rent it out. Well, how much am I going to earn and what's my cost going to be? What, what money do I have to put in to over time get those earnings back? So anyway, um, and we can see this one's a blend. I think if we look at VU, it's going to be a little further to the right, I'm guessing. We can go to VU now. Go to portfolio. Yeah, it's a little bit more towards growth. Not a massive difference. But because of that, it will have outperformed, I'm going to guess, in the over the last 15 years. We can compare it here, VDIGX. Can we compare? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the dividend is red, and you can see at least we're only oh, this is one month. Let's uh, let's start at five years. So at least right now, um, VU is outperforming, but you know here it was underperforming, right? And if we go to Max, Max here probably won't work. Yeah, you can ignore the Max because they they don't line up the time periods. Like the the, the VDIGX hasn't existed as long. So um, what we can do, let's just go. We'll just do 93. So let's go here and we'll do, um, we can set the date ourselves. Let's do set, let's do uh, 93. Let's see if this works a little better. Yeah, so it, it's underperformed significantly, but also value generally, and it, it, it's more, more towards value, it's really a blend, has underperformed the last 10 or 15 years. So where does that leave us? My personal preference is just to stick with the stock market as a whole. Now, one could argue what you really want is VTI, which uh, encompasses pretty much all U.S. companies. But we know that VTI and VU, they're very similar in terms of performance. Um, so at the end of the day, I don't think either fund is, is, is a bad fund. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, obviously, but they're both reasonable. I personally would like something that's more covering the whole market. That's just my approach. Whew. Okay. David's watching. It's one in the morning. Well, it's 7.34 here. It's... It, I guess it is dark out now. It was light. I still haven't gotten adjusted to new time. All right. What do we got next? Oh, let's see. Hang on. Just checking something. 
Still at 4% on having bought Bitcoin the first time this year. I'll end the poll. Amid wants to know, what would you say to a person who doesn't have a 401k, but they're maxing out their, I assume, Roth IRA? Well, keep doing that. Saving a taxable account. Talk to your employer about getting a 401k. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world not to have a 401k, but, you know, particularly if you can get one where there's an employer match, boy, I mean, it makes a huge difference. And, you know, uh, you hate to have that be a major factor in where you're going to work, but probably is a factor. Um, but, you know, just you, you, you got to do, you got to work with what you got, right? Um, and if you don't have a 401k, you just take advantage of what else you, you can do in the Roth IRA or, or traditional, depending on your circumstances or are, are good options. Um, you know, you might have an HSA and you could use that for, you could think of that as additional retirement savings would be another option too. Okay. Stephen points out that if you're timing the market, you've got to be right twice. Well, that's twice on each round trip, right? And then you got to do it over and over and over again. I think if you're doing it based on valuation, one could argue it's not exactly market timing, but it does feel that way. I know, um, but still, you still gotta you still gotta get it right. But what, however you want to, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I'm just I have no confidence in my ability to do that. All right. Let's see here. This looks like a complicated question. For an early retiree that needs to live off taxable accounts for 10 to 15 years, leaning toward building muti bonds to allow for more Roth conversion, lower return rate may help with ACA. Thoughts? That's a complicated question. So if I understand it, you're going to retire early. You're going to live off of taxable accounts, I guess, till you get to 59 and a half, presumably. Of course, you could tap retirement accounts sooner. There are ways to do it, but in any event, um, so you want to do Roth conversions. But I'm what I'm lower return rate. So meaning municipal bonds have a lower return rate than regular bonds, than stocks. I mean, the yields are lower because of the tax advantages, right? Um, you want to do a, but here I guess I'm I'm a little confused because if if you're going to do Roth conversions, um, of course, that's going to come from, a, a let's assume, a traditional IRA. And so you want to keep your income down to a level where you can still get ACA credits. All right. So that's going to dictate in part how much you convert. But it sounds like what you're saying is you don't want investments in your taxable account that throw off a lot of interest. In this case, I guess you could have stocks that throw off dividends, but you haven't mentioned that, that throw off a lot of interest because that's going to eat up some of your 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 taxes as well. Your 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 um it's it's gonna be, be part of your taxable income. Although uh with the muni, of course, uh you're not gonna have federal. You may or may not have state, depending on where you live and the municipal bonds. Um yeah, I mean, uh, I, I guess that could be an approach. I guess the, the bigger question for me, though, is apart from taxes, as important as they are, and ACA credits, is an investment in municipal bonds the right thing for you? And how much of your taxable account is going to go have to go into municipal bonds to achieve the tax uh, 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 outcome that you want? And if you find yourself putting a lot more in muni bonds than you otherwise would just to get a specific tax outcome, that I would have pause on that. Um, it, it, it at least would be a question. What would what would what would your your taxable accounts look like if you didn't have to worry about the ACA and the Roth conversions? Would you still be putting all this money in a municipal bond fund, let's say, or, or muni bonds? If you're investing in individual bonds, those would be questions. Um, and then I guess part of it too would be how much money are we talking about? And in, 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 in terms of the ACA credits, uh, you know, is it talking about 
maybe just losing some of those credits, all of those credits. Um, could you, you know, are, are, do you have stocks in your taxable account? And what does that investment look like? And are they throwing off dividends, um, which could have an effect? That's a tricky question, though. There's there's just so many moving parts. I'm not sure what else I could possibly say that would help you. <laughs> Whew, you guys, are, these are tough questions. I, I like the chess question best. All right. Looking for more. Remember to put my name if you have a question for me. Here's another volunteer, Sarah, mentoring low-income single mothers who are in a nursing program. That's fantastic. Uh, Rob Harris volunteers in the Neighborhood Association of Local Parks. Can you give an update on your credit card rewards? I can. So I stopped uh, taking all the rewards and putting them into it. So I had them in different accounts. Like at one point I tested out the Vanguard. Well, let me back up for people that don't know, don't have any context here. A couple of years ago, I decided to start uh, inv investing all of our credit card rewards. So, you know, I cashed them out. And I'd put them at first, I put them in bank stocks. Then I put them in, I want to try out Vanguard's uh, digital advisory service. Then I, so I put them over there. Then I moved it all over to Betterment and had it there. And then I pulled it out of Betterment and I've not really kept up with it. I could recreate it, meaning I could go back and look at all my records and recreate it. And in fact, let's do a poll. Should I do that? Should I? Um, start tracking credit card rewards again. I'm going to, yes, no, and I don't care. <laughs> um, but the idea was I wanted to show, uh, one, it gave me an opportunity to, to try out these different services and share my thoughts on them. But it also allowed me to say, hey, look, you know, Investing relatively small amounts of money over time actually makes a difference. And I think the account got up to like 40 grand at one point. And actually, it would be higher than that today. I could go back and look at it. I mean, what I did was I, when I took it out of Betterment, I just mixed it into our accounts. But I could figure out what, what it would be. But I, I didn't, I don't know. I wasn't convinced that, I, I hadn't convinced myself how useful it was. Uh, but what I back then, I, what I would do every now and again is do a video that says, um, you know, here's the status and whatnot. My actual strategy hasn't changed. I use a Bank of America, uh, premier, I think it's Premier Rewards. You get, it, depending on if you have extra money at Bank of America or Merrill Edge, you um, you get um, up uh, additional rewards. So like I get a minimum of like, I think it's 2.63 or 62% on all purchases more if it's like, a, I think a restaurants. Um, we use the Amazon prime card for Amazon and whole foods. Uh, those are our, probably our two primary cards. And then I have business credit cards that, that generate a lot of um, cashback rewards. And so the, 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 the amount of money, I mean, it, it adds up and it gets, it's pretty significant. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. 44% say, I don't care. I get it. 42% say yes. That's a pretty significant number. 13% say no. Like, for the love of God, Rob, don't do it. I'll leave the poll up for a little bit longer. But but um, I don't have a dollar amount that I can tell you it's worth X now. I'd have to go back and, and um, uh, recalculate it. And then I'd have to figure out how I see part of it is like, how can I segregate it from my other investments so that I can keep it a track of it, which is not, I mean, I could do that. It's not that hard, but we'll see. It's neck and neck between yes. And I don't care. So I'm just, I'll just, I'm going to leave it running for a bit and I'm just going to do whatever you guys tell me. It's like Elon Musk on Twitter. I'll let you guys decide. 
There's someone that, that volunteers at stray animal adoption program, transporting animals from shelters to vet. Oh, that's good. Then to foster for adoption. Lovely. This is a great question. I used to, um, this used to worry me. By the way, I'll show you what, while I'm answering this question, I'm gonna show you what I see on my screen on the left here while I'm taking a poll right here. The I don't care is winning 44%. So that's not looking good for the yeses. Anyway, I used to be concerned about this like years, years ago that, that you know, you have all these, these folks retiring and they're going to take all their money out and prices are going to crash. But uh, yeah, that's just really not how it works. I mean, demogra well, demographics can absolutely affect a market for sure. Um, and it's an interesting dynamic in the United States because there's a lot of talk about how immigration has affected GDP. And is that good or bad? And I'm not going to get into the immigration issue. Um, but I, we are an aging population. And so, you know, immigration could be a significant part of um, our economy for better or worse, right? And, and there's a lot of arguments that immigration actually has some positive effects on uh, our economy. Uh, but at the end of the day, yes, as people retire, they're starting to spend their money, but a lot of that wealth is going to get inherited down to younger folks. And um, I've not read anything. Maybe it's out there. I've missed it. I'm sure that could possibly, that could very well be the case that gives me any reason to be concerned um, about that possibility. It's just, there's so much money in the market and yes, a lot of people are retiring, but they don't spend all their money uh, right away. And in fact, a lot of them don't spend much of their money as it turns out kind of interestingly. Um, plus a lot of people that are retiring don't have much in, 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 by way of investments. It's, it's, I'm, I'm sorry to say, and are living a lot on, are relying a lot on social security. Um, but I'll keep an eye out for papers on that. I'm sure there, there are some that I've no doubt missed that have done some good analysis of that question. So here's a good question. It says, since uh, from SRD, since, since uh, the financial crisis, basically, Stocks have been valued higher than their long-term historical averages. Why? Well, interest rates were a huge part of that. Uh, no, no question about it. Um, as interest rates go down, asset values go up. That's just the way it works. Um, obviously, other things affect it as well. It's not just a question of rates, but that's a big, big part of it. Of course, interest rates have come up, uh, uh, as we all know, um, still on the lower side of history, I would say. but. Um, you know, right now, what you've seen is, notwithstanding the rise in rates, a very strong economy. Uh, you know, we're near, if at or near full employment, um, and and so uh, the, you know, earnings of companies are, have been quite strong. Part of it is the 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 uh, the tax cuts of 2017. The corporate tax cuts that result in more earnings. Uh, you know, after tax earnings, so. You know, there's probably a lot of factors. Of course, that was, you know, since 2017, I think, right? Um, but, but to me, that you know, those would be at least some of the reasons. I'm not an economist, but I think um, taxes and interest rates are a big part of it. Uh, you know, some some will look and say, well, now it's AI and it's generating a lot of efficiencies. I I'm not convinced that's true yet. Obviously, AI has had a big impact on some companies, of course. You know, NVIDIA is an obvious example of that. But um, we'll see. That's my take. So Elsie wants to know my thoughts on equally weighted S&P. So just so we are all on the same page, uh, the S&P 500 index is a cap-weighted index, which means Big companies like Apple take up more of the index than smaller companies. So if you put $100 in an S&P 500 index fund, or let's just say $500, what they don't do is put a dollar, invest a dollar into each of the 500 companies. Apple gets like $5 or more than that. We can look at it. I can show you. Um, here we go. So this is Vanguard's S&P 500. 
when we come down here, no oh, Microsoft, I guess they've they're bigger now. So you know, for every hundred dollars, uh, seven dollars and twenty five cents goes to Microsoft uh, stock, and six sixty two to Apple, and three seventy three to Nvidia, and on down it goes. Um, and so that they call that a cap weighted. Cap stands for capitalization, the value of the company. You can also buy an equally an equal weighted S and P, which does um, pass it out, you know, and divides it equally among the five hundred companies. The net effect of that is, um, and maybe it's easier to show you. So when we look at an S and P five hundred, we can see the blue dot here is large companies. If we put up an equal weighted fund, it would be more between the mid and large. It would, it would, this blue dot would come down because more money is getting invested in smaller companies, right? Because it's equally weighted. It's not given, you know, it's not putting more into Microsoft and Apple than other companies. Uh, what I prefer to do is to have sort of a, a, a total U.S. stock market fund, which would be something, you know, I would use VTI but it's gonna look a lot like the S&P 500. We can look at it, go to portfolio. It's not gonna look much different. It's a little lower, the blue dot, if you, but not much. Um, and then if I want um, additional exposure to smaller companies, I might add a small cap fund or you could add, add a mid cap fund. I just prefer to do it that way. I feel like I have more control over it uh, than an equal weighted. Um, and, you know, the other thing, though, is I think some folks get nervous. They say, well, with a, with a cap weighted, uh, it, it's sort of dumb money and it's investing in expensive companies. And, 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 and it, that's true because it's just tracking the market. It's saying, look, I'm not smarter than the market. I'm just going to track the market. And in and, and any market, there's always expensive companies. It's just the market, right? I mean, right now, the top 10 have to be happen to be companies like, Microsoft, Apple, and, and NVIDIA, but it changes and it's going to change again. Um, and companies 20 years ago that were in the top 10 aren't, some don't exist and some are no longer in the top 10 and that's just the way it goes. And um, it'll change as, you know, the, the S&P 500, a fund will change as those changes occur in the market. And I'm okay with that. Um, but, but again, if you want to tilt your portfolio one way or another, I just find it easier to just add the small cap fund itself my, rather than going with like an equally weighted fund. But, you know, you could, you could do, you could, you know, there's a lot of different recipes to get to the same kind of thing. All right. Okay. Hector wants to know if I have thoughts on using um, an, uh, an SMA like Fidelity's tax managed US equity index strategy to optimize tax loss harvesting in a taxable brokerage account. I do. And I did a video on it on direct indexing. I'm not a fan. For those that aren't familiar, you can put money in, a, in, in an account. All the SMA means is that it's going to be an account managed by Fidelity rather than by you. Uh, and um, rather than investing, let's say, in an S&P 500 index fund, for example, they'll invest in the actual stocks, not necessarily all 500. You don't need to invest in all 500 to do a fairly good job of tracking the S&P 500. But they might invest in 100 or more, and then they'll buy and sell to try to take advantage of, of, of potential tax losses. If, if, if Pepsi is down, they might sell it so you, you get that tax loss because this is a taxable account and go buy Coca-Cola, for example, to avoid the 30-day wash sale rule. Um, it sounds good, but everything I've read uh, says that the benefits, even if you've got a big lump sum of money to invest, the benefits of tax loss harvesting over time diminish because over time you you end up with just gains over time, right? Uh, at least hopefully. And then what you end up with is a portfolio with a hundred or more positions in it. It's a complete mess in my view. And you're, you're, you're kind of stuck paying, I think it's 40 basis points at Fidelity, I think, paying 40 basis points for the rest of your life or having to take over this 
complicated portfolio or selling it and incurring all of the tax gains that you were trying to avoid by, by buying into the fund in the first place. So I really think direct indexing is, is not ideal for the vast majority of people. There could be some exceptions for extremely wealthy people who are putting a lot of money into these kinds of funds every year, maybe. But for the most part, I'm just not a big fan. That's my take. I did a video on it. Let's see here. Direct indexing. Let's go to videos. Ah, I'm I'm number one on 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 uh, you on uh, Google. How exciting! In this video, we're going to take a deep dive into direct. Here it is. That's the video. So um, yeah, uh, you can check that out. I published that one year ago. I'm standing up because my my back is still not a hundred percent, and it's I get stiff sitting in this chair. Oh, oh, whoo! I'm gonna stand up again. So I've been at a standing desk all week. Believe it or not, my back is getting better, uh, but man, it's still not a hundred percent. All right. What do we got next? Do I look younger in that picture? I think I do. I've gotten so old in the last year. What is going on? What's this one? I'm still standing, so I'm going to keep the screen up. Okay. In moving to retirement, do you suggest moving your 401k from your prior company's plan to your own IRA? Well, generally, I, I, I probably... You know, there's the rule 55, if you're 55 or older and you retire and you want to take out money from your existing 401k, you can penalty free. So if you're doing that, you wouldn't want to roll it over. But assuming you don't have any of that going on, uh, with it, one advantage to rolling it over is you get to pick where you keep it rather than, you know, what your what your employer has picked. But of course, you know, maybe your employer is at... Um, a place that you like and you like the investment choices. Um, I generally prefer an IRA. There is technically potentially some additional protections from liability that a 401k could provide maybe, but I would say for a lot of folks, that's not really a key issue. Okay. So a senator here wants to know my thoughts on Fidelity Contra Fund. It's funny that you mentioned that because I did a video, um, I guess it was last week, and I mentioned and looked at Fidelity Contra Fund. Uh, yeah, the distributions were substantially lower than past. I don't know about their distributions. I mean, we can look at them. Contra Funds had a great track record. Uh, here, I'll show you, show everybody. Here it is. Um, but, I, you know, I still don't think it outperforms an index most of the time. It's a super, uh, uh, you know, large cap growth fund. If you compare it to a, a growth index, like we, we can do that. If we go to the chart and we can compare this to, um, I guess, VUG would be a good example, maybe. Um, if we go five years. Yeah, over the last five years, uh, VUG has outperformed. Again, we can't go to max. So we'd have to figure out, let's see, 93. We could figure that out. But um, in terms of distributions, you can go to uh, performance and then distributions. Yeah, in 2024, hardly any. I don't know why. But also, uh, my question to you would be, what's the, like, why would we care about the, I mean, particularly in a taxable account, you want lower distributions, right? Um, but a couple of things here. So most of their distributions are long-term capital gains, right? They're, the dividend yield, I'm sure is, the yield I'm sure is quite small, I would think. Yeah, just 0. 0.43, because right, it's a growth fund. So they're not going to pay a lot. Um, and dividends. And then uh, one thing you could look at, let's go back a year. 
So if you look at last year, uh, in February, they paid very little. No dividends, a, a small amount in long-term capital gains. Most of it came in December. The year before, yeah, so most of their payouts look like they come in December. Now, I admit this February it was really low. I don't have an, I, I, I don't know have an explanation for that. I don't know why. Um, so good. I, well, to the extent that they're distributing short-term and long-term capital gains, uh, yeah, I don't know why. I mean, we could guess, but uh, I don't know why. I don't know. My favorite answer. All right. What is next? So I have 40% of my portfolio in a CD ladder. Should I count them as my bond allocation? Yeah, I generally think of it as fixed income, which would include bonds and CDs. So I would. That's how I would think about it. You, Yeah. You know, I wouldn't count it as cash per se, right? Assuming I'm assuming there's some amount of penalties. I mean, if you have some CDs that are maturing this year, one might argue that should be cash. Um, but I kind of I tend to lump cash and bonds together in my thinking anyway. Some people, you know, mentally it's better to sort of keep cash as separate. So I suppose if you had a CD that's going to mature in the next 12 months, you could you could maybe think of that as cash. But otherwise, yeah, I kind of consider it as part of fixed income. So David says, I believe I heard you talk about dividends and the fact that they are irrelevant. Uh, it's a little strong, but okay. In terms of a stock or fund's value. Okay. Seriously, then, why do you choose SCHD as a value fund? Well, what value fund could I pick that doesn't pay dividends or above even above average dividends, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know of any. Um, I mean, I understand the word dividend is in the name of the fund, SCHD, uh, but it's a value fund. I picked it because it's a value fund. I mean, all the value funds pay dividends, right? I mean, that's the whole, you know, that's sort of the, uh, the type of companies they invest in are value companies that tend to pay higher than average dividends, right? Just like growth companies tend to pay lower. So, um, but by the way, I, it's in a, there, that's in my Roth account. So, you know, I could care less about the dividends. I mean, and that, that may be too strong, but it's not as if I'm investing in them because I want dividends to be paid to me so that I can then live off them in retirement, for example. They just stay in the account and get reinvested. Um, I picked that because it's a value fund. Yeah. All right. What is next? What time is it? 8.03. Okay. Oh, this is interesting. I didn't know this. Passive 101 says, Betterment changed their core portfolio away from value. Ah, that's interesting. Would you keep the old value tilted one or switch the new one? Um, I mean, I'm imagining both options are reasonable. Um, you know, if I had to pick right now, which one will do better over the next 10 years, I would pick value. Why? Because it's underperformed over the last 10 or 15 years. That would just be my guess. It's just a guess. Okay. Jim says, uh, moving 401ks to Fidelity, thinking about moving three raw stem on finance for a secondary custodian. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, I haven't, no reason I haven't talked about M1. Um, I, you know, I think in retirement, I really like platforms like Fidelity and Schwab because of all of the associated services that come with them. I don't think there's nothing at all wrong with M1. And um, I like their ability, you, you know, you have the ability, particularly in a, in a, in a Roth, where you don't have to worry about taxes. Very easy to rebalance. I like that a lot. Um, you're not going to get the same level of services you would with Fidelity, but maybe that's okay because you've got your 401ks at Fidelity and you can get all the services you need there. So I certainly 
don't think it's an unreasonable approach, but just keep in mind, Fidelity and M1, they both serve different purposes, but they're night and day in terms of technology and services. I, you know, Fidelity is head and shoulders above M1 in that sense. Now, if you're 25 or 30, you know, you're just saving for retirement, you don't need a lot of what a Fidelity or Schwab can offer, really. And the ability to rebalance very easily can be very attractive uh, with M1 finance. And again, you might like it with your Roth. So certainly don't have any reason to think it would be a bad decision. Hmm. Boy, this 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 is again like another SAT question. I want multiple choice. I guess you've given me three choices. Mimi says, for short term, two years or less, safe tax efficient investment. Which one would you choose? Muni bond, short term, short term T bills, two year tips. Um, hmm. Well, part of it depends on your tax bracket, state and federal, right? Uh, and, and whether you're also going to be able to avoid state income tax on the municipal bonds. It's just a tax question. The higher the bracket tax bracket you'll be in, the more attractive municipal bonds are. And you can do an after-tax analysis and compare the two. As between TIPS and T-bills, um, both would be reasonable. If you're doing a short-term T-bill, you're going to have to roll it over every Let's say you do a three-month T bill, you have to roll it over every three months, and so you're, you're going to have rates that vary over the next two years. Uh, which one would would prove to be better between a short-term T bill and two-year tips? I have no idea. It's going to depend on inflation and interest rates, and there's no way to predict it, in my view. Um, for short-term money, I, my my personal choice are T bills, um, but. That doesn't mean that's right for you. That's just my, our own choice. So, uh, Kevin, I don't know if this is a question or a statement. All five-year rules end at 59 and a half. I don't believe that's true. The, the, the five-year rule on conversions does. And, and if you want to make sense of that, remember the whole purpose of the five-year rule on conversions is to prevent people from trying to get around the 10% penalty if you take your money out of a traditional IRA you know, before 59 and a half. And so to, to, you know, without that five-year rule, what some folks could think they could do is um, convert the, the, the traditional to Roth, pay the taxes, got to pay that anyway. And then thinking, well, I can pull Roth contributions out anytime I want penalty and tax-free. I can then take it out of the Roth and avoid the 10% penalty. You can't do that. But of course, once you turn 59 and a half, you don't have to worry about that 10% penalty. So that five-year rule goes away, but the five-year rule that deals with how long, uh, uh, with deals with owning any Roth IRA account for at least five years, that does not go away at age 59 and a half. That's my understanding. Now, maybe is there a new law out that changed it? Could be. I don't know. I don't think so. But anyway, that's my understanding. Jim says he needs help with Empower. Well, I found their support helpful in the past. It may take a day or two, but that's that's what I would do. If you, uh, my question, I guess, would be if you tried that. What do we got here? From like this guy, my wife's ex mother, my wife's ex's mother. Taught her another saying, like, as fat as a tick, which was, maybe I should have read this before I put it up on the screen. That smell would knock a hound off a gut wagon. I don't I don't even know what that means. Well, referring to a wagon with animal, oh, ooh. wow. Another one my mom would say is, you're so lazy, if a hog were rooting you, you wouldn't yell suey, something like that. I'm still not sure what that means. I grew up in Ohio. I don't know. I know it's knee high by the 4th of July. I know that. Okay. So here's an interesting question uh, or comment from Wolfster. For note taking and converting PDFs to articles, take a look at Google's Notebook LM. I've tried their Notebook LM. I like the concept a lot, uh, but I'm not sure how it would help me convert PDFs to articles. 
what Notebook LM allows you to do is uh, it's it, it's kind of like creating a custom GPT. You can you can upload up to twenty sources, and each source I think can be it's ridiculous, like two hundred thousand words or something. But you could upload PDFs, for example, and then ask questions about those PDFs and take notes on them. And it's a, it, I, I like the concept a lot. And I, I've played with it. I haven't figured out how to like incorporate it into my workflow at this point. So Doug says, I have a 90-10 allocation for retirement. Does that mean I should allocate my savings and non-retirement accounts the same? Well, if they're for retirement, right? Because you can save for retirement in a taxable account, right? So, but but I guess it depends on what the savings and non-retirement accounts are for. If they're long-term for retirement, I don't see why not. Now, you may think about asset location and keep bonds in a in a um, a traditional retirement account and stocks in Roths and taxable if you can. Uh, so that every individual account might not be 90-10, but when you added it all up as a whole, it would be 90-10. I hope that makes sense. Um, I think I've done a, let's see if I've done a video on asset location. I have. Here we are. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. And Once again, I look younger. I don't know what's going on. Um, this was a year ago. I don't know what I said about it. Managing asset location in early retirement. So it might be a little different than what you have in mind. But in any event, yeah, there you go. And I'm standing up again. Oh, his back is killing me. All right, what else do we have? From Sharon, is there any benefit to moving a minor custodial taxable account to a Roth IRA? Uh, I don't know that you can, Sharon. I don't know how you would do that. Right? I mean, you 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 can convert a traditional IRA to a Roth, but you're talking about a, you can't convert a taxable account to a Roth. You can make contributions to a Roth, but the individual has to have income, earned income. So I'm not unless. Again, I could be missing something. Maybe I don't understand the question, but I'm not sure how that's possible. Whoops. I didn't mean to do that. But we'll look at this question anyway. From Christopher. What stock bond mix works well with the 4% rule? Well, let me tell you. So Bill Bengen, I can answer this question in my sleep. But let's pull up Mr. Bingen's paper. I'm pretty sure it's one that I have in my... There it is. Here it is. So this is his paper from 1994. Oh, there it is. Um, and uh, he looked at different stock bond allocations. And what, what he concluded... Uh, you can check that out on the site. I'll just answer the question. What he concluded was that you needed somewhere between 50 and 75% in stocks and the rest in bonds. Now, for him, stocks was basically S&P 500 bonds or intermediate term U.S. government treasuries. And um, that really supported the highest withdrawal rates, what he found. If you went below 50% in stocks or above 75%, you could run into trouble. Um, having not enough stocks was a much, much bigger issue than having too much. So like if you had to err one way or the other, you'd want to be over 75 rather than under 50. But the problem with being over 75, particularly if you, as you get near 100, if we go through something like the, the stock market crash of 29, those first three years was down like 90%, it, it would get, it gets ugly. And so the sweet spot was between 50 and 75%. He ultimately concluded that, and, and remember this paper was written the, the intended audience uh, for that paper was financial advisors, not consumers. Now, it's not a, a difficult paper to understand, but
But uh, his point was, you know, to advisors, you know, you should you should get your clients as close to 75 percent as they can tolerate. Now, he did some additional papers later. Ninety six was was the next one. And he looked at ratcheting down uh, the amount of stocks by about one and a half percent a year. And that could possibly be a good move. But it didn't I don't think it moved the needle a lot. But yeah, so that's that's what he concluded. Somewhere between 50 and 75% um, with sort of a, a bias towards being as close to 75 as possible. Keep in mind, it, there were a ton of assumptions in this paper, a ton. 30-year retirement. If it's longer or shorter, the, the initial withdrawal rate changes, right? You're not paying any investment fees, uh, you know, uh, certainly no AUM fees, so no no investment fees. You're using just U.S. stocks, S&P 500, for, for, for your stock allocation, intermediate term treasuries for your bonds, so no international. Now, in subsequent papers, he looked at other asset classes, but in this paper, that's, you know, that's what he was assuming. He was assuming that you retire on January 1st of each year that he looked at. And you may say, all right, I get that, Rob, but I mean... What if I retire on February 1st? Is it that big a deal? Well, it turns out it is. Now, is it a huge deal? No. Um, but the safe withdrawal rate actually goes down if you analyze it on a month-by-month -month basis rather than a year-by-year -year basis. And if you think about that, it makes sense. What are the odds that the absolute worst time to retire is going to happen to fall on January uh, retirement that begins on January 1? My point in bringing all that up is just to say, there were a ton of assumptions that went into that. And since then, 30, year, 30 years of research, people have challenged those assumptions, looked at different assumptions, including Bill Binken himself. So it's just something to keep in mind. You're sorry you asked now, aren't you? Well, if you're not, I'm sure everyone else watching is sorry that you asked. One of my favorite topics. Oh, this is a good question that I may not be able to answer. Cannibalistic. Hmm. What is the best resource to understand how Social Security, RMDs from uh, an IRA, and taxes work together optimally? Well, I just did a video on that. Um, and there's a lot of papers on it, many of which I mentioned in the video. Let me find that video for you and I'll show it to you. I forget what I called it. It was an efficient withdrawals. Must not have been. I guess I could just go to my YouTube channel and go to videos. Ah, I called it. In what order? Hey, everybody! Welcome back to the financial. In what order should you spend down your retirement accounts? That was the video, and I looked at new retirement, which I think is a good tool. But I also um, talk about some resources, and if we go to, let's see here. If we go to my research page, again, I've only got like a dozen articles up here. I've, as you saw from Zotero, I mean, you know, I've got a lot, a lot more. Um, but if we go to topics and we go to withdrawal order, you'll see a number of um, papers. One that I like a lot is, I think it's this one, T. Rowe Price. Yeah, I thought this was a pretty good paper. And at least gives you a sense of the issues, and it, you know. And on top of that, I like their colorful charts; very bright. So you could give that a try. I think that probably give you a, a lot to chew on. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Keith says he put his question in multiple times. I, I don't know. I don't know what the question was. I must have missed it. I'm going to end the credit card rewards. It looks like the I don't care has it. Although technically you could say I should do it because you don't care whether I do it. And 40% want me to do it. So maybe that's the answer. Uh, let me see if I can go back here and find Keith's question. Looking, looking. 
Susan is very kind. You do not look younger than. It's all about haircut and facial hair. Yeah, I should probably just get rid of the beard. I don't know. Keith, I may just this may just have to I may just have to give up or you can ask it again, but sorry. I must have gone right by it. Yeah, I don't know. I can't find it. Yeah, this is a good credit card. The 2% cash back with Fidelity goes right into your brokerage account. 2% is solid. You could do better than that, but that's that's really good. I don't have that card. I probably should get it. Oh, look at this. Captain Nightwatch, I have an interesting volunteer job. I'm, I'm an admission rep in the United States Naval Academy. Well, thank you for your service. Yeah, that 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 ain't easy to get into. I've had some friends of ours have had, you know, their kids have, have, have gotten into the Naval Academy. Ain't, ain't easy to do, that's for sure. All right. Let's see. Jeff says, I just signed up for new retirement. I plan to use a three-fund portfolio with new retirement modeling taking from lowest percent earner. Won't it always model draining the bond fund? That's not how it works. I don't think. If I understand your question, in new retirement, you have your different accounts. Oh, I, maybe I, I do so what you mean. Well, the way new retirement uh, works in terms of drawdown is it'll take from your taxable accounts first. And if you have multiple taxable accounts, it'll first take from the, the one with the, lo the lowest assumed returns. And you set the returns for each account. So like for a checking account, maybe you've got it at 0%. So your checking account, it'll draw that down first. Of course, you probably don't have a whole lot in your checking account, I mean, relative to a retirement saving. So it's going to draw that down pretty quickly. And then it'll go to the next one. Um, and so I, I guess if you had all of your bonds in one account and all of your stocks in another, and you set uh, the percentages accordingly with bonds having a lower expected return, and it's in the same type of account, tax, because it goes taxable first, then traditional, then Roth, you're right. But you wouldn't have to set it up that way, right? You could have it all. Remember a new retirement. You don't have to map your accounts one to one. So if you have an IRA, you could have one IRA, but represent it in five different accounts inside new retirement. Or you could have five taxable accounts. I don't know what you crazy people do. Maybe you've got five taxable accounts. You can model that as one account in new retirement if you wanted to, or three or whatever. So you have a lot of flexibility to affect the order of withdrawals. And then, of course, you can actually go in and set a specific transfer. So for example, even though they take from taxable accounts first, if you said, well, no, this year, I don't want to take from taxable accounts. I want to take from, from a traditional. You can set up a, a transfer from the traditional account to that checking account. And so it would skip effectively skip the taxable accounts. Uh, well, the checking account's a taxable account, but I mean, you know, your investment accounts. If that makes sense. I know it's probably easier to show you, but that would take some time. I will tell you, I plan to do another live show during the week. It won't be this week um, on new retirement. The last time I did one, someone left a comment I thought was very good. I tended to cover what I what I think are maybe some of the more complicated scenarios uh, in the last live stream. At least they're complicated to me. And the person made a comment and said, you know, it would be great if you just start with a sort of a basic plan and sh walk through it from start to finish, not all the fancy stuff, just the basic, how do you set it up and do a basic plan? And so I am going to do that, uh, Jeff, maybe that would be of interest to you. I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some notice ahead of time. I don't know when it will be, but it should be in the next month. Okay. All right, Sam has a question, and I'm going to stand up again just to make sure I can. All right, Rob, first time ever commenter here, is tax-efficient investing something that low-income beginners should really be stressing about? Um, that's a great question. 
Well, first of all, and I'm still standing. <laughs> you just have to look at me stand. Um, definitely don't want to stress about it. The good news is it's very, it's very easy uh, to think about tax efficient investing. So first of all, as a beginner, if you're in a retirement account, 401k, IRA, you don't have to worry about being tax efficient, right? Because it's not going to trigger taxes. Obviously, if it's a traditional account, um, when you take the money out, you'll pay taxes. Uh, but um, I didn't want you to see me sit down in case I, I fell. <laughs> it's really not quite that bad, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be looking forward to, to going up and relaxing on the couch after this, if I'm being totally honest. Uh, you know, if you're in a retirement account, you don't have to worry about it. And in a taxable account, you know, index funds are incredibly tax efficient. I'd probably keep bond funds out of my taxable accounts if I could, but an S&P 500 or a, a total U.S. stock market, very tax efficient um, way to invest. So it's not complicated, Sam. Here's the thing. Low income, maybe small amounts of money. You're right. Maybe not a big deal now, but in a taxable account, over time, you, you could end up with substantial gains. You know, think 10, 20, 30 years from now. now. Again, if you're in a retirement account investing, it's different. You don't have to worry about the tax efficiency. Um, but in a taxable account, given enough time, uh, maybe making a little more income, saving more, it grows. Um, over time, the, the tax hit will surprise you. It's like a snowball. And eventually it starts a rolling. And so you don't want to totally disregard it even when you're starting out. But again, it's it's not hard to do. It's not like, you know, just a few things. And, and you're, I think you're, you're most, most people are, are probably set. All right. I'm going to scroll way down. Yes. Bullseye. I do need to get a real office here. I'm going to go ahead and get an, uh, 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 is it Herman Miller? Do I have that right? Yeah, I'm going to get a Herman Miller chair, I think. The one I've got, but but I, this is an uplift desk. So let's see. I'm going to I'm going to raise it. It'll probably um short out something. We'll we'll it'll it, if it ends the live stream, I'll see you in 2 weeks. What? Let's see here. There we go. So yeah, I, and uh so I've been standing all week. I I should stand more anyway. This seems kind of weird. Uh, but I'll, I'll keep with it. No, I won't. I'll put it back down. Um, there we go. It's a great desk. Bamboo. Love it. I do back exercises every single day, Vinyl. I do the McGill 3, um, which are bird dogs, McGill crunches, uh, and side planks. I do what I call alligator breathing. I don't think he calls it that, but it's basically lying on your stomach and breathing and letting your lower back sort of sink into the floor for, for three minutes, which is really good. Okay. I think we're about out of time. What else we got? I, you know, last time I'll, I will put up, um, and this will give me an excuse to stand back up. We did a few chess um, puzzles last week. And so we'll do another one or another couple. I won't do a lot because, like I said, I need to call it. So um, for those interested, uh, white just moved the queen to here. So it's black's turn. Well, I must not be signed in because, oh, I'm in check. No, this I started to say, well, this is this is easy because I can put him in checkmate. But that would be an illegal move because I'm in check. Um so yeah, take a look at that. Let me look at, for some more questions, and you can you can uh, leave in the chat what move you think I should make or we should make. Uh, so um, Alex says, "P Schiller P's average of the last ten years. Why should I? Why would I care?" Well, the theory is that it's a more accurate assessment of the stock market's current value. Uh, you know, if you think about just looking at one year's worth of earnings, that's arbitrary. Why do we pick one year? Why not something else? And the theory is that with 10 years, we get to see earnings over a, a complete economic cycle. So it's more accurate. Having said that, you can be a phenomenal investor and not care at all. <laughs> so, you know, there you go. 
So Ed wants me to do a video on TSP and retirement. What I might want to do, Ed, uh, and you know, I live here in the Washington area, so it's a big thing here. Maybe I need to find someone who actually has a TSP to interview because I've, I've, I've never worked for the federal government uh, or the military or the post office. So I don't have a TSP, never have. And, you know, I could maybe do, I guess, a lot of research and figure it all out, but it, it'd probably be more useful to you guys and gals if, you know, I had someone that actually knew what they were talking about, <laughs> you know, had some experience with it. So I have to think about who, who that might be. Well, uh, I'll just do this one and then we'll get to the chess puzzle since it is 8.30. Thoughts on VTSAX forever. I like it. I mean, that's just the, that's the total stock market, I'm pretty sure, right? I always think in terms of, of ETF tickers now. I think, you know, could you add growth or value? I mean, I have a little bit of tilt towards value. That's been my own inclination over the years. Today, it's my tilt towards value today is probably the smaller than it's ever been uh, because I do own SCHD, um, but... Uh, very relatively very very small amount um so i i just I, I used to get into the whole let's let's add emerging markets and let's do some small cap value nothing wrong with that approach i followed it for 20 plus years but but at this point i'm just very comfortable keeping it simple and just doing a simple um portfolio at least as simple as i can get it so all right we have answers here. What? What? Uh, let's see. In terms of the chess puzzle, no one is. No one. Oh, king to g six. So the trick is, we've got mate in one, right? But we got to get out of checks, and we have right now. We have nothing to hide. You know, we, we got to be careful. We got we, we nowhere to hide the king, um, and we got to be careful about this diagonal, right? Because it might expose us to check on the with the bishop, if he just you know if he just pulls the moves the pawn forward that may or may not be a serious concern um i don't see moving i don't know that moving to the back rank is going to help us but we got to be careful here because if we go here and he checks us yes we can pull the rook back and maybe that's uh to interfere with check where do we hide our king that's the question I'm going to go with King G6 because I don't have a better answer. Now what do we do? Obviously, we can pull the rook back here and attack the queen. And at that point, he has no checks. But we also don't have checkmate, and we're down a bishop. So we really got to checkmate him. We could go here. My thinking is the king here. And if he checks us with the king, we'll move the pawn forward to block it. But see, I, that even concerns me because he could check us here on e1 and force that force us here. I don't know. What do you, I'll just do whatever you guys say. King h5. That's my thinking too, but that's scary. We got we got to deal with the we have to think about the pawn check. Of course, the queen check, pawn check, we move here, but he can check us here and we're checkmated. <laughs> so wait a minute. Uh, if we go here and he pushes the pawn, uh, I guess we could come here. But then he pushes that pawn and checks us. I don't know. I'm nervous about, I'm nervous about king h5. I, I'm 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 going to do it anyway, but I think we're going to get a red X. No, that was right. There we go. Okay. Oh, he can't check us on F1 because of the rook. That's what I was worried about was the F, F or the F8 check. See, but now, yeah, we're safe. See, I wouldn't have gotten that without you guys. All right, we'll do one more. Then I'm going to call it a night. Always, you guys must like chess because. There's still a lot of people watching, even though we've left the, the the investing. Maybe I should just turn this into a chess channel. I don't know. All right. So one way to think about a puzzle like this, it's black to move, right? Whites move the knight to A3. So you can go through a checklist. And the first thing is, does black have any checks? Well, 
one, right? Queen, queen to, to g2. Queen, this queen taking the pawn, um, which at first may seem like a ridiculous move, but sometimes ridiculous moves are, are the right moves. But that one doesn't seem very good because after the king takes it, I don't really see a follow-up. There's a rook check on d2, but the bishop's covering it. Plus, you know, it just doesn't seem right. So that doesn't seem quite right. Um, but one thing that catches my eye is that White's queen seems like he's in a bit of a she's in a bit of a precarious place. And I think, well, wait a minute, can I move the bishop here? Where can the queen go? Can't take it because I'll take with the queen. Can't go here because of the pawn. Can't go here because the bishop would come back and take it. Can't go here because the knight would take it. Can't go here or here. That seems pretty good to me. Uh, uh, now, uh, let's think about this. Black, white does have a check here. But I would just drop back to d8. Uh, oh, that's interesting, though. If, if I drop back to d8, white could take this bishop attacking my queen. Of course, instead of that, I could just move the rook here to interpose the, the bishop. And maybe that's the answer. I think that's the answer. So that's my that's my thinking. Does that make sense? Is anyone even still watching? I'm gonna have to check. Everyone's probably left the chat. No one's. Oh, we got bishop. Uh, yeah, a lot of bishop g4. Four. Okay, that's what we'll do. I bet they're gonna check. We'll see. Bishop g4. Yeah. So I think it's the rook, right? I think it's. Are anyone with me? Anyone care at this point? I think we enter. Normally, you wouldn't want to block a bishop check with a rook, because the bishop can take the rook and. Generally, a, a, a rook is more valuable than a bishop. Now, it's not always true, of course, but but again, if I go back here, I can't go here, right? Because the queen. I guess I could go up, but it doesn't matter. Bishop takes, and now if I take back with the queen, I can take the bishop. If I take his queen, he takes my. I think I got interpose. Yeah, that was it. And you can analyze these on chess.com, by the way. Great uh, tool. Um, so we can go here and we can say, okay, if I did this, what was the answer? Yeah, sure enough, you can see here they give you a different um, lines. And, and what, yeah, that was my concern was this, right? And now white's winning, actually. So tricky, tricky. All right, gang, thanks for your patience as I have to stand up and sit down 20 times tonight's uh, live stream. But believe it or not, the back is getting much better, just not 100%. So uh, as always, I had a lot of fun. Thanks for watching um, and uh, have a great week. Until next time, we should be back. You know, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. Let me just double check my calendar. Yeah, I should be back on the 25th. So until then, I uh, hope you have a great couple of weeks. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy uh, is a good back if money could buy it. If not, I guess it's financial freedom. See ya.